My name is Max. So today we'll talk about predicting and mitigating emergency situations on the roads. So we will use not only transport market examples, we will use the specific examples from a railways business. But before we start, let me introduce myself. As of today, I have a, over 10 years experience in that data science, machine learning. And so I, I worked in different business sectors, such as telco, fintech, consulting, and the entertainment industry. And recently I worked in the World Music Group as a director of research and analysis. But now I'm a data science lead in the consulting company Metis. So uh, welcome on board. And uh, today we will talk about to how to save uh, environment and how to make uh, money, how to bring uh, additional value for our business. In our case, it was a transport company. It was a project was implemented for one of the largest uh, railway companies in Europe and had a big impact. So the results were truly transformative. And uh, of course, we will talk about it uh, as well. But let me introduce what the approach we used, I and my team. Here is what we are going to cover today. The first, I'll introduce the problem, we'll set out to solve, then I'll walk you through our approach and the data we'll use. And what kind of model we built on this data, what the problem we have, what the challenge we faced, and of course, we'll dive into the result. Actually, the problem must sound like pretty simple. Freight car derailments are happening across the network of railways companies. And that the main point when we needed to address the problem and develop and execute the system which could prevent the bad events. We used different data, but we needed not only based on data built the predictive model, we needed to describe and we needed to define the patterns which could help us to prevent the derailments. This problem is not just about avoiding accidents. Of course, it's about uh, saving lives, uh, predicting problems and uh, protecting the environment and saving million of dollars in uh, repair cost. And, but the problem solving plan and our approach looks like the first one, we gathered historical data and identified the key target. Of course, in our case, it was a derailment, but overall it could be just a problem and some risks and some emergency situations on the road. Then we assess the quality of the data. Of course, we can't skip this step and to ensure the accuracy. So we developed a model that could predict the probability of freight car derailments. And lastly, we evaluated the results. So we built a roadmap of end-to-end -end process that delivered real value from start to finish. So that's the first challenge where we faced. It was the parameters. And uh, it was the data and the verbal ga gathering and the f figure out what kind of data we have. But we used 78 key parameters from various systems ranging from track conditions to weather, locomotive data and wagon details. But in addition to those 78 parameters, we used also sensor data, which was captured on the track, on the wagon. And based on that, not only daily activities we've seen. We've also seen actually real-time data from these sensors. And also we engineered 30 calculated indicators. This include features, average cargo weight, time between repairs, and other factors that gave us even deeper insights into the understanding of our problems, understanding of our business. Data processing was also crucial. So we used standardization for quantitative variables and one hot encoding for our target variables, derailment, ensuring that our model could accurately interpret all of this. And when we figure out what kind of parameters we have, when we process all data, we switch to the next step, exactly model. So here is where we faced a major challenge, class imbalance. Because of the event of derailments, the event of emergency, it's really rare when we compare that to non-events. So only 1% of the data represented derailments 
and 99% were non-events. So we have the two options, of course, obviously, undersampling or oversampling. But if we reduce the number of non-events, it means that we could lose valuable data, or we could use a more than oversampling, more smart way, I use a SMOLT. So SMOLT is a synthetic samples for a minority class. In our case, it was a zero element, it was a target. And it helped us to creating more diversity and improving uh, the model's performance. So it means that it's uh, smarter than just adding a random target, right? SMOLT. Uh, that's why we used it. So we did try building the model without any oversampling, but the results were poor. That's uh, why SMOLT allowed us to improve the prediction accuracy without compromising data integrity. And it's far better solution than the basic sam oversampling, because basic oversampling is just a random oversampling. But SMOLT uses uh, patterns which our data, which our parameters, not only target, which our independent parameters consist of. When we implemented the SMOLT, when we figure out the problem of proportions, so we needed to address the step of what kind of model we need to use. So for model algorithms, we choose a random forest, of course, the standard question, why? And because it's really powerful model that could help us interpret parameters well, and mostly importantly, it has less tendency to overfitting. Of course, the many models which we built had a tendency, had an alignment to overfitting because it has an imbalance. But we covered that using SMOT and we covered that uh, using random forest. So given the assumption that we have the risk of imbalanced data, despite SMOT, this was the best choice for balancing interpretability and the performance. So based on metrics on the left side, you could see true positive rate and the false positive rate. So we get really pretty great results, like 80% uh, of both. But now let's talk about ROC AUC and the PR AUC. Both are crucial for us, but they tell us different things. ROC AUC shows us how well the model differentiates between events and non-events overall, which is great for understanding general performance. As we can see, we had a strong score. It's 0 0.91. But with the class imbalance, which we faced in our case, we needed to check that using PR AUC because it's even more crucial in that case. It focuses specifically on how well the model predicts the minority class. So derailments in our case. So we, could, we had a good results of PR AUC as well, meaning our model excels at identifying events. So looking at both metrics gives us a full picture of the model strings. And when we build the model, here's where the real world applications comes in. So you, you can see the scroll button, it's probability of derailments in a technical language, it's called a cutoff threshold. So we can manage that based on the available resources. If our organization has uh, limited resources for inspections, we can set and concentrate more on the probability on the high value to only focus on the highest risk freight cars. This way we prioritize those that need attention most urgently, ensuring that resources are used efficiently. So of course, if we had uh, infinite resources, we could a bit decrease the probability, a bit decrease the threshold. It means that we could check the wagon who could fall, but with a less probability than other. And, but the random forest we used not only because it's a really great algorithms for a lot of data we could use. It's not only because uh, this kind of model, this kind of approach really is working good with imbalance. But one of the key reasons we use random forest was to understand the Gini impurity, which helps us see how different variables impact derailments. So simply talking, we just needed to use a variable importance. So for example, winter season shows a strong influence, but that's something we can't control. 
On the other hand, factors like a wagon type or cargo weight or the material of the track section are things we can control. And we needed focused on that, allowing the business to focus on area where changes will have the greatest impact. Even though we've identified key variables, these are not full risk profiles. It's just the importance of our variable, which we put into the model. But we needed to move beyond this to understand exactly which combination of factors lead to derailments to prevent this derailment. So we needed to get a scenarios, we needed to get a patterns which could get to derailments of our so to do that, to create the actionable risk profiles for our business units, we fed the probabilities from our random forest model into the decision tree. So it looked like just an ensemble of a model, but this was a critical because the decision tree offers clear interpretable results, which random forest does not provide. This showed us exactly how variables combine to create high risk scenarios, allowing for precise targeted interventions. Now we had a, not just the predictions, but insights into the why and how the elements were likely to happen. So what, how we can read that, how we can interpret that. So from that profile, for, from a random forced probability, which we could put in the decision tree, we could get the next risk profiles. That's, let's consider the one example. So if the number of wagons is below 38.5, the years since in issue are less than 51.5, and the speed ratio on the last section is below 1.0, there is a, that means that our wagon get to fall with a 94.5 probability of derailment. So that's why we need it to get and this is what the company needs to prevent derailment. So not only probability, but clear actionable patterns. And finally, here's the, our results. First, we achieved an 80% of reduction in the accidents, fewer accidents, of course, so it means less downtime and a safer, more efficient transportation network. Secondly, we help minimize environment risks Derailments often lead to significant environmental damage, of course, but by predicting and preventing them, we're protecting both the company and the environment. Of course, we it's really complex to translate it into money, It's but we try to address not only quantitative purposes, we try to reach the aim of qualitative approach and qualitative KPI as well. We saved the company 12 million a year. These savings came from reducing the need for uh, emergency repairs and assuring insurance payout. So if you have any questions, please uh, reach me out on LinkedIn. And uh, I hope that this short presentation was uh, a bit inspiration for how IoT and data-driven insights can not only be buzzwords, but it helped to predict challenges, but actively and actively create safer, smarter roads for everyone. Hopefully together we could reshape this industry and the future of connected transportation. But by the way, today we'll talk about not only future, we talked about the present, where we could already implement and execute all AI applications. Thank you.